Good morning. Welcome to the Waterview Church of Christ. We want to welcome you. We're glad you're watching wherever you are. If you're here locally or if you're abroad, we are glad that you have tuned in. We sincerely hope that you and your family has enjoyed a great holiday weekend celebrating the birthday of our country this weekend. We hope that you were surrounded by people that you love and you were able to enjoy this uh, festive time. I hope that you'll take your Bible. Open it up to the book of James. We're going to continue a series we started last week from the book of James, calling this series Real Faith. Last week, we mentioned that the book of James has been compared by some to the book of Proverbs. One reason it's uh, compared to Proverbs is because it's wisdom literature. But uh, another reason, perhaps somewhat tongue-in-cheek, is that they both, at first glance, seem to address a plethora of spiritual issues while changing topics every few verses. Some have even compared Proverbs to a dictionary. You know, there's a new entry, uh, page after page after page. And some say that that's kind of the way James reads. It, it just addresses a lot of different things every few verses. And, and some say that they don't see a whole lot of continuity within the book of James. And again, at first glance, I could see how someone might compare James to Proverbs in that way. But with some closer inspection, I would suggest to you that I don't really think that that is a fair assessment to the book of James. As we suggested last week, many believe that the epistle of James might have been the very first New Testament epistle written maybe sometime uh, in the late A.D. 40s. If such is the case, the topics James addresses fit perfectly with the idea that Christianity is really a religion that's all about faith. But the common theme to the book of James is it's not just how we profess to have faith, it's how we practice our faith. It, it appears that that's one of the things that was missing during this time as James wrote to these 12 tribes of Israel dispersed, those who had become Christians, those who had given their lives to the Lord. It seems that one of the things they were missing was this idea that real faith is actually something that comes out with the fruit of your life. It's, it's more than just what you say, it's how you live out your faith. And it should be accompanied by, in the wording of James, works. Maybe a better expression, it would be, it would be accompanied with action. Faith that has action. Now, last week in chapter 1 of James, we noticed how a person of faith responds to their own personal testing. How, how faith responds to what happens to us. We talked about how there uh, is the response that we need to give to the testing of angels, the response we need to give to the testing of worldly wisdom, what we called worldviews, the testing of temporary situations like what if you're poor or what if you're rich, or the testing of 
personal responsibility and not blaming things on God, especially and obviously in a secondary way, not blaming things on others, being personally accountable. And then the testing of dealing with anger is another key issue. And it, it depends on our faith how we respond to this personal trial or testing in regards to these topics. Now, as we go into chapter 2, in James 2, the subject matter of practicing faith doesn't change, but the emphasis does. In chapter 2, the emphasis shifts to how a person of faith responds to the trials of others. This flows naturally from the admonition at the very end of James chapter 1 and verse 27 that people of faith, people that know the Word, should do the Word. And one of the ways we indicate that with our lives is that we visit the orphans and widows in their affliction. So how does a person of faith respond when other people have adversity? Now, if you know much about James 2, you know that there are two major sections to this chapter. And most of the time, we divide that into two different lessons. But in this lesson, we're going to see how both sections are connected with the idea that people of faith must respond to the faith trials of others, just as we respond to our own trials. The two trials that others experience that are considered in James chapter 2 or how faith responds to partiality, and then secondly, how faith responds to poverty. That's what I want to talk about this morning with you. Both of these are real hypotheticals as they are introduced with the word if. In both cases, the hypothetical is introduced with the word if, but many believe that these things were already happening. And and no doubt, no doubt in the way that we struggle with this type of subject matter, no doubt these things were happening. And perhaps James, while addressing this as if this happens, he knew the people that would be reading this would know these things had already happened. And certainly we know in the course of human events, we tend to struggle with these types of things. So let's see what James says. Let's take this test, this personal test of how we respond to the adversity of others. Let's begin by considering how faith responds to partiality. That's the first 13 verses of James chapter 2. Let's set the stage by reading the first three verses. If you have a Bible there, read along with me, beginning in James 2, beginning in verse 1. He says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit at my feet, That's the situation that James is describing, and we'll see the response to that here in just a moment. I think building off the brief discussion of the poor and rich from James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, as we noticed last week, James now is offering this very tangible example of how favoritism or partiality plays out in the life of a real local church. Now, couple things to note. First of all, I want you to notice with me that James doesn't seek a social or an economic solution to this issue. He doesn't seek a a social or an economic solution to the differences that result in there actually being some rich people coming into the church and obviously some poor people in the church. I would observe with you that as long as time has stood, there has been that distinction. Some people have some, something, or more of things, and others have less. And so there will always be the rich and the poor in this world. The correction that James gives here is not about correcting the finances. It's about correcting the faith. The faith 
the faithful are to hold as they practice the faith of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the entire discussion here in James 2 presupposes the reality of differences within the church. James is right in line with verses like Galatians 3, verse 28, which indicate differences existed in the church in the first century, and so we know that they'll exist today in the church as well. Differences existed in the church then, like being Jew and Greek, or slave and free, or male and female. And James teaches that in the church there should be no distinctions made. And in this case, he's talking about between the rich and the poor, but I'm sure the other things obviously would apply to this church, the ones who were reading this as well. In this example, the faith of Christ is being practiced with partiality. Now, the hypothetical is the church is coming together, is meeting. I just stop and say that's something that we wish we could do more and more often, and we're in this, this strange time where we're being limited to be able to come together. But here in this case, and under normal circumstances, churches come together and they assemble. The church is meeting. And then here's the hypothetical. James says two different kinds of people come into the assembly. There is a rich man who comes in. A rich man with a gold ring and fine clothes. And then there's the poor man in shabby clothes. And that's all that James says about the situation, but we might actually extrapolate the possibilities even further. One of them probably smells better than the other. One of them has clout and, and the other doesn't. One, when the assembly occurs and the contribution is given, one can give and the other one probably can't. We could keep running down that rabbit trail, but you see... You see the differences here. Now, here is the challenge. Here is where the person of faith is tested. In essence, James says, you're the church usher. He is saying to you, as you read this, as you apply this to yourself, he is saying to you, you are the church usher. What are you going to do? Perhaps some of you, uh, who are members here at Waterview, or if you're a member, a member at another congregation, you understand this concept. You know, there are ushers that assist people in getting in, finding a seat, and such like. But just imagine, even though you might not have ever actually done this job, just imagine today, nobody else can do it, and you have to do it, and, and this situation happens. The rich man in fine clothes with a gold ring walks up and needs to be seated, and about that same time, the poor man in shabby clothes walks up and needs to be seated. What are you going to do? It puts the person of faith on the spot. When this happens, what are you going to do? Are you going to cater to the rich man? And are you going to treat the poor, poor man with contempt? What are you going to do? Here is the temptation. Here is the temptation to show partiality. And because this is a temptation, no doubt, James drops what I would call some truth bombs on this situation. He says some things to really make us think so that we won't be guilty of holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with partiality. Here's what James wants you to know. Number one, if you are partiality, it is not Christ-like. It's not Christ-like. Now look at the text, and let's pick up the reading in verse number four. Remember, the situation is the rich man and the poor man, a man has come, have come into the assembly and you've got to make a decision about what to do with them. You are the usher. And in this case, this person says to the rich man, you come over here. 
You, sir, you sit in a good place and you say to the poor man, well, you can't even sit down. You, you go over there and stand. Or if you are going to sit, then you sit at my feet, which would symbolize that that person is below you. If we're tempted to do that, the first thing James observes is this is not Christ-like. Verse 4, he says, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. We should understand that the temptation to show distinctions, to show partiality, in this case, is not Christ-like. Here's why I say that. The very ministry of Jesus shows us that He had a heart for the poor and the downtrodden. If Jesus was the usher and this situation happened, Jesus would have given more attention to the poor man. Because that's how the ministry of Jesus worked. Listen to this. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. Jesus had gone into the synagogue in Nazareth, and he got the scroll, and he opened it up to this place, which is a reading from Isaiah chapter 61. And he began, as Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 says, by saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, the the very ministry of Jesus was based upon outreach to the poor, to the downcast, to the very one in this example that James uses is shown partiality and is given a lower place to be among God's people. And that is not the way Jesus would do it. So that's that's the first problem that James says. It's not not Christ-like. Second problem is it's... Not common sense. If you keep on reading here, continuing in verse 6, going down to verse 7, he says, Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into the court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? James is appealing to their sense of consistency. And he's saying it's, it's just not common sense for you to understand that it would be better for you to treat the rich man better than the poor man because think about the ones who give you the most problems in your life it's not the poor man it's the rich man he reminds them that the rich ones are the ones who generally give them the most problems so it's it's not christ like number one it's not common sense and then number three it is not consistent with the scripture now here he's appealing to their sense of consistency in regards to the scripture if you're there in james chapter 2 let's let's keep reading beginning in verse 8 he says if if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture you shall love your neighbor as yourself you're doing well but if you show partiality you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has, made a, has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to 
to one who has shown no mercy, mercy triumphs over justice. The royal law here, the royal law is the law of the king. And you know what the goal of every person of faith is? Is to carry out the royal law, the law of the king. And James reminds them that all the law of God falls under two commands. He just mentions part of one, and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. But that, that makes us remember, as it's given to us in the Old Testament, the, the whole law is based upon two very, very simple concepts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so he doesn't even have to refer to the first thing. Mentioning the second one, love your neighbor as yourself, he, he, he's basically saying, so you already know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and this is how it applies to this situation. That's why he mentions it. While they would have professed that this is the royal law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, while they would have said, that's right, yeah, that's true, that they would have professed one thing, but you know what? Apparently, there were some who weren't practicing it. There were some that were not practicing it, and they were showing partiality. James is attacking their human sense of consistency all of us have that i think it's part of our conscience we we know when we're being inconsistent and james is saying you need to be consistent you need to understand that this is a real sin you need to understand that and he uses the example here of you know someone shouldn't commit adultery and someone shouldn't murder and they would have known that because they know the law of god and he said you know it's one thing for you to not commit adultery, but what if you turn around and murder somebody? Have you really kept the law? Of course not. And he says the royal law, the law that the one of faith is supposed to carry out in the, this Christian age, is you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You love your neighbor as yourself. And he's saying, you may say you believe that, but you're not doing it. And when you don't do it, he just comes right out and says, you are committing sin. The sin of partiality is not consistent with the Christian faith. Partiality is from a Greek word which suggests, listen to this, the fault of one who, when responsible to give judgment, has respect to the position, to to the position, rank, popularity, or circumstances of men, and here's the catcher, instead of their intrinsic conditions. This sin has two parts. It is only seeing the outward, and it's failing to see the inward intrinsic value. Other New Testament passages teach us the very same thing about this sin, the sin of partiality. Acts 10.34, Peter says, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. And when you go read that in its context, it's so powerful because that is when he is being called to preach to to Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, a Jew going to a Gentile, and he he knows that God wants the Gentiles to receive the gospel, and he says, I know it, God is not a God of partiality. Paul said it three times in Romans 2, 11, Galatians 2, 6, and Ephesians 6 and verse 9. He says the same thing in everyone, God shows no partiality partiality and so the idea is if god doesn't do that we are to be practicing the faith of jesus christ the son of god we can't do that either the subject of racism has been at the forefront of recent events and in our age the meaning of racism is sometimes difficult to define but god uses some terms if you're struggling with that god uses some terms that really help us to see how ugly partiality really is right here. Just just look at the Scripture, and the Scripture lets you know what you need to know about this situation. Partiality, number one, is a failure to see the intrinsic value of all. I I gave you the definition of partiality. That's the word that's used in verse 1. And it is a failure to see the intrinsic. This would be the God given value of each and every person. This is their soul. And partiality 
is a failure to see that intrinsic value. Number two, partiality is, is what we do when we make distinctions. That's the word that's used in verse 4. And this word, the biblical meaning of this word, is synonymous with to separate people, to segregate people, or to discriminate against people. This is God talking to us about the sin of partiality. It's making distinctions that we shouldn't make. Number three, it is becoming judges with evil thoughts. That's what he says in the latter part of verse 4. When we make these distinctions, he says you're becoming judges with evil thoughts. Number four, it is dishonoring. Verse 6, he says you've dishonored the poor man in this case. Number five, we've already noted in verse 9, it's sinful. He just comes right out and says it. He says if you show partiality, you're committing sin. And then number six, don't miss this. It's also judgment without mercy. And that's what he says in verse 13. And I don't know about you, but when I go stand before the great God and judge of this universe, I want mercy over judgment. And how I judge other people in this life will determine how I'll be judged by God. And I want mercy over judgment. Jack Wilkie is a good young preacher, and he suggests that we can show racism in three different ways. Number one, by having hatred. Number two, by sinful pride. And number three, by practicing partiality. That's what James is talking about here. How do you know? Well, just think about those three things. If you hate someone else because they're different from you, in this case, because their skin color is different from you. If you hate someone else, you're guilty of this. Number two, if you have the type of sinful pride that causes you to, to, to view someone as lesser than you, you're guilty of this. And then number three, if in being partial, you treat someone differently, you, you separate them or you segregate them or you discriminate against them, then you've become guilty of this. And remember what James says? Don't, go, don't get mad at the preacher. I'm just telling you what the Bible says here. James says, if you're guilty of this, it is sin. And there's only one thing that a real person of faith would do if they're guilty of this. They would repent. They would go in their closet, they would examine their heart, and in repenting, there would be a change of attitude and action. Okay, so that's the, that's the first part of James chapter 2. It's a great test of real faith, and that is, uh, how do you respond to partiality? Now, really quickly, and this is a major section of James chapter 2, but I just want to run through part 2 of this section with you. And there's another test here, and it's also connected how does faith respond to poverty? Now, the connection is there's a poor person that comes into the assembly. What are you going to do there? But now, now, what about when you leave the assembly and let's say you're, you're going home or it's Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever, and you encounter a person of poverty, a poor person, a person who's, who's hungry or they don't have proper clothing. What are you going to do? How does the person of faith respond to that? James, in this section, is teaching us about real faith. But, but don't miss the part here that he's saying the, the real person of faith responds to the adversity of someone who is lacking, to a hungry, hurting brother. The problem that James highlights is that faith will get a bad rap when people of faith respond with a dead or demonic type of faith instead of a dynamic working faith. When we get this right, when the needy are helped, faith is verified. When we get it wrong and the needy go unassisted, faith is vilified. So let's break down these 10 or so verses um, and let's understand what James is saying. I'm going to break it down like this. Number one, there's a proclamation regarding this. Uh, look at verse 14. He, he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith and does not have works? 
And then the proclamation extends down into verse 17. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. There's a proclamation. Involved in this, again, is this hypothetical situation. So there's a proclamation and then there's the situation. Now verses 15 and 16 give us the situation. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and, and so here's the situation, you're going to come upon this situation, and what are you going to do? He says, if one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? The situation is such, you're treating with contempt this individual. It's, it's almost like pouring gas on a fire because not only are they in need and they're hurting and they're suffering, you come up and you act like a person of faith and you say, be warmed and filled, and then you walk away. And you don't do anything about it. Terrible, terrible response to faith. There's the proclamation, there's the situation, and then in verses 18 and 19, there is this conversation. James says, uh, but someone will say, and, and he's just giving a, uh, an example of how two people may have a conversation. One is a person who believes that faith is, is shown with action. And another one, it sounds like, is the person that believes that I can just say I've got faith and that's good enough. James says, this is how this conversation may go. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. See, what we need to understand is in conversating about our faith, it's going to become obvious if we've got real faith. Because one can say, well, I believe, but then if it's not shown or proven by our actions or by our fruit, do we really believe? Even the devils, the demons believe and tremble, but obviously they don't show their belief with proper works or proper faith. A proclamation, a situation, a conversation, and then... There's a great illustration, and, and this is the part of this chapter we love so much. Beginning in verse 20, he says, do you want to be shown? Here's an illustration. Do you want to really know what real faith in action looks like? Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And then he gives us the example of Abraham and Rahab. And what he basically says is these are people of faith, but how do we know they're people of faith? They proved it with how they obeyed the Lord. They proved it with how they obeyed the Lord. So a summation here would be that true faith is more than what we say. True faith doesn't actually need words. If we're a person of true faith, we show it. True faith is obviously more than what we believe because the demons have it. And yet they tremble and yet they do not actually believe and they do not obey. And then true faith is going to be judged by its fruit. How do we know Abraham? How do we know Rahab were people of faith? Why are they mentioned in Hebrews 11? Because they showed their faith by their obedience to God. James 2 is a challenge to how our faith responds to the adversity of others. How will my faith respond when favoritism is shown? How will my faith show or respond when I encounter poverty? A great test of faith. Maybe all of us need to take a hard look at our heart and ask ourselves, how did I do on this test? And if we see a, a place and a need for change, then we need to go talk to God about it and we need to follow that up with a change in our action. Thank you again for joining us. We're going to continue in this service this morning. Uh, Brother Ronnie, one of our shepherds, is going to come share some congregational news and lead us in a shepherd's prayer. And then Brother Robert will come and once again lead us in the participation of taking the Lord's Supper. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you this morning. I uh, hope that everyone has had a wonderful and safe 4th of July. 
I'd like to thank Jason for uh, another great lesson from the book of James. And really, uh, I'd like to thank all of our ministers who work uh, very hard each and every week to keep us spiritually fed. We truly are blessed to have these group of men with us at Waterview that work so diligently to, to uh, keep, us, keep us fed in God's Word. On behalf of the elders, we'd like to thank everyone for their support and their prayers throughout uh, this time of separation. But I think we can take comfort in knowing that even though we are physically separated, we are united in our faith with one another. And just so we want everyone to know that if there is anyone out there in our congregation that knows of someone in need and needs some help, we'd like for you to contact either one of the elders or ministers so that we may assist in that help. We'd uh, also like to remind you to continue to look at the newsletter each week for coming updates. That way uh, you can be informed of what's taking place here at Waterview. I'm going to go through a list, our prayer list, and then we'll have a prayer. Ben and Diane Beal have recently been suffering some falls and having mobility problems. We uh, want to keep them in our prayers. Lexi Bradley, the daughter of John and Cheryl uh, Bradley, and the granddaughter of Robert and Melora uh, Oglesby, uh, had surgery on a blood clot in her leg last week. She's now at home, but still having some issues. John Childress, Childers, the husband of Beth Childers, is having a fight with cancer, and we want to remember him. Dina Honeycutt, my daughter, is doing well from her hip surgery and is at home uh, and uh, recouping from that and getting stronger each day. Tyke Lackey, the infant son of Wesley and Jennifer Lackey, continues to have some issues with the, his digestive system, and we'd ask that you continue to pray for him as well. Uh, Willie Maxwell, the father of Chris Maxwell, is home and doing better from his uh, stay in the hospital. Let's remember him as well. The father of Lenine is home now from his stay in the hospital with some breathing issues. And uh, with the help of some assistance in, with a machine and stuff, is, is doing a little better. So let's remember Lenine's father as well. Abel Ramirez's sister, Armada, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that, she's in the hospital at Parkland. She's been an in and out, and we'd like uh, to remember her in our prayers as well. Larry and Lori Stanley are still struggling with their health issues, um, and it's been an ongoing thing for them, so continue to pray for them. And we got notice uh, that Mitch Nutterville uh, had, had had to have surgery on his knee. Uh, what, they were vacationing in Yellowstone, and he was thrown from a horse and had to have emergency surgery on his knee. And our sympathy goes out to Heather Tickner for the loss of her grandmother. So if you will, let's bow now as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Will you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this day. We're grateful, Father, for giving us another Lord's Day that we may come to you to worship you, to listen to a portion of your word. And Father, we're grateful that we have this avenue of prayer, that we can lift up our loved ones, our cares and concerns, and that we know that you will hear us. Father, we now ask that you be with many of our number, and we now lift them up to you. Father, we ask that you be with Ben and Diane Beal 
as they continue to suffer mobility problems, and we ask that you give them the strength to get better. Be with Lexi Bradley after her surgery with a blood clot in her leg, and we pray that she'll continue to get stronger and be on the mend and be back to full health. Be with John Childers, who is battling that fight with cancer. It's such a terrible disease, Father, and we pray that you'll continue to give him the strength to fight. There's so many in our number, Father, that are, that are battling that disease, and we ask that you be with them and watch over them as they, they continue to battle. We're thankful for Dina's recent uh, successful surgery on her hip and for continued improvements. And Father, we ask that you continue to be with little Ty Clackey as he has struggled from birth with some health issues. And we pray, Father, that things will get better and he'll be fully healed from all this and that you'll be with Wesley and Jennifer as they attend to his needs, Father, and that he will, uh, in the future, be healed from all these problems and, and grow to be strong and healthy and a vibrant. Father, continue to be with Chris Maxwell's dad, Willie. After his stay in the hospital, Father, but he is at home now and he's improving, we ask that he continues to improve. Continue to be with Lenine's father in Nicaragua that is having some breathing issues, but with some assistance is, seems to be doing well. And we want to continue to pray for him and his strength to get better as well. Father Karen Porter had recent surgery on a knee replacement. And Father is at home and recovering from that. And Father, continue to be with her as she uh, strives to get better and that she is back to full use of her knee again. Be with the Stanleys as they continue to uh, struggle with their health issues. Father, give them, give them strength, give them healing, that they may put this behind them and, and go uh, have a, a, a better and healthy life. Be with Mitch uh, Nutterville, Father, as he has undergone some emergency surgery on his knee. We pray that, Father, things will uh, heal, and we're not sure whether he'll have to have some more surgery, but be with them. It's got to be a uh, it's difficult, Father, when things, accidents happen, but we pray for those that are tending to him uh, that they will uh, attend to every, all of his needs and that he will uh, get better from the accident. Father, be with Heather and the loss of her grandmother. Father, it's a difficult time to lose a loved one, and we pray, Father, that you will comfort them in their time of loss. And we want to pray for all those that have lost loved ones in the recent weeks. Comfort them. May they look to you for the strength that they'll need each and every day. For those who have lost jobs, Father, we pray for them because of this uh, virus. Father, be with them. We pray that uh, at some point in time, Father, that they'll be able to, exceed, uh, to seek some employment and that their lives will get better. Father, we want to pray for the elders and the ministers here, that you will guide us, that you will help us and uh, make the decisions for the flock that will benefit and be the best for our members here as well. Father, be with this country as it is uh, in such a, uh, an unstable time. Father, we pray for peace. We pray for that everyone involved will look to you for the guidance and that peace that they need. Father, continue to be with us as we go through, our, through the rest of this week, that you will guide our steps, and that those that look at us will f see that love and that, that Christian love that we should uh, show to the world, and that having do done so, that they will want to know more about you. Father, when we fall short and we, not, and we don't do those things, 
that are that you would want us to do, we ask for your forgiveness. But Father, we're thankful for your son and for the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will give you a moment to get elements together for the Lord's Supper before we begin. When we come to the Lord's table, we come to celebrate spiritual realities. There's the atonement where sin is paid by the death of Jesus himself. There's forgiveness where God lets go of the sin of his people because they've been immersed in his blood. But when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with all of these great spiritual realities, he gave the disciples something tangible to do. There was something to eat, a small morsel of bread unadulterated by yeast, there was something to drink, juice which hit the tongue and went to memory. And for the rest of their lives, the disciples, when they took the bread and they drank the cup, something happened. That physical experience brought back so many things to their mind. They remembered the night when it was instituted that Jesus washed their feet. They remembered that Jesus turned to Judas and with that cryptic comment said, what you do, do quickly. They remember, at least Peter, James, and John, the only time they ever saw him again was when he kissed Jesus on the cheek on the night of betrayal. They remembered him talking about going away how they wanted to come with him. And they remembered how when he talked, there was a heaviness in his soul that they had never quite seen before. Now, when they ate the morsel of bread and tasted the juice, it brought them back, back to a night, back to what they told them, back to what he did for them. They remembered. Thus Jesus said, This do in remembrance of me. So we remember the person of Jesus with a human body nailed to a cross as we eat the bread. Let us pray. Our Father, we are grateful for this day because it is Lord's Day. Is a day in which we come together, even though scattered so far, in one heart, and one mind, and one faith. We come back to the cross again. We see the body of Jesus hanging, knowing it was not just an event of history, but the death of, and the giving of that body gave us destiny in so many different ways. And so, Father, as we eat this bread, bring to our mind our own salvation and the great depth of love that provided it. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
We also remember the blood trickling from Christ's body, a trickle that swelled into a flood to forgive all mankind. And this is what we see as we drink the cup. Let us pray. Father, the gift of the blood of Jesus overwhelms us. How could someone die in our place, shed blood, which was his life, so that we, so many centuries distant, could live? And yet, Father, it is that blood that we remember while we drink the cup, which gives us our daily life in Christ and our hope for the future in heaven. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We continue to thank you for your generosity. So many of you continue to give week to week, which allows us to do so much. Radio program to our Hispanic community, missions around the world, helping people in our community with their financial and personal needs. Without you and without your faithful stewardship of your funds, we cannot continue to do that. So we do thank you for that. If you'd like to give, you can send your check to the church building and it will be deposited and taken care of. Or if you'd like to give online, that is available on the Waterview website, waterview.org. And at the top right-hand corner, there is a link called Online Contribution. If you'll click on that link, you can give either by bank account, check, or a, a credit card. And we appreciate very much your gifts at this time for keeping this church able to be focused on the mission that God has given us. As we close this service today, we'd like to pray together, followed by some more singing. Father, we're grateful that we have been together today, that you have joined our hearts and minds from so many different directions, that you've allowed us to open our hearts to your word and our lives to you as we have examined each other's individual responsibility as we see ourselves better today. Father, we pray that as we leave this time, there will be the glow throughout the week of changed character, stronger faith, and greater hope. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.